Okay. Hope everybody can hear me. My name, uh, as Spencer said, is Wes Culberson. I live in Santa Cruz, California. And I'm a clinical medical physicist. I've been working in purely clinical for the last five years and I've talked at some dosimetry meetings. And I look forward to talking to you guys today about image registration, data fusion. Uh, here's a picture of a surfer because Santa Cruz is known for its, its big surf breaks. So if you guys ever come to town, make sure you bring a wetsuit. The water is really cold and check that out. If you have any questions today, uh, I can see your questions. Not everybody is able to see the questions. You can type them in the question box. Since it's a pretty full crowd, we'll probably, I'll probably wait to answer those questions till the end. It will also kind of help the presentation flow. Uh, but if there's anything urgent, like you can't hear me, uh, Spencer will help address that. So today we're going to be talking about a few things. I've sort of split the webinar up so that the first third of it is going to be a little bit technical. Some of the algorithms that are used for image registration and fusion and you're not going to need to remember every single slide and every single type of algorithm because I can't keep them all straight either. A lot of it's going to be behind the scenes in your software. But just like your treatment planning system, it is really good to know what's happening and it helps you understand the whole process a little bit better. And then I'm going to talk about using image registration and treatment planning. So a little more practical applications of this, how we use it day to day some example cases that we've seen in our department that are interesting. And so I think we're ready to get started. I don't see any questions, so I assume this is all going just fine. Uh, a disclaimer that there are different software vendors, and I'm going to mention a couple of them in this presentation. Uh, you'll probably recognize the slides as being from some vendors, so I don't endorse any particular type of this software. Uh, and another disclaimer is that I know some handouts were given to you yesterday. I made a few slight changes. I think the slide number, about halfway through, I added a slide. So it might be off by one. Uh, but basically, the handout should be a good guide and should be just fine for today. So as an intro, imaging itself has been the basis of our modern radiotherapy for a while. We're seeing an explosion of the number of modalities and the way that the number of these mod imaging modalities are being combined. So the PET-CT was exciting a while ago. Now we're seeing an attempt at putting MRI units in the treatment rooms uh, with our accelerators, MRI, PET-CTs all combined into one. We're, you know, what, what's really revolutionized things was, was viewing things in a tomographic plane, so in 3D, that's sort of obvious, but that's really changed a lot since we've had that. So I'm going to start off and just want to poll everybody and find out what, what treatment what are you guys using for your image registration? So let me come over here, start up the poll question real quick. Okay, so the, some people might just be using the treatment planning system. Some might have purchased some extra software. Some might be just using some software that came through CT scanner. And maybe someone's using some homegrown software at a university, or maybe you're not using anything, and you're just here to learn about it today. So why don't you guys go ahead and chime in and let me know what you're using. Okay. So the votes are coming in, and it looks like most people, about 75%-ish, are using the treatment planning system only. I'd say that's not a surprise. Uh, about 20% are using some third-party software. And there's a handful of people that are using some other types of registration software. So you know, our department purchased some third-party software a year ago, and I bet that we're not going to be alone, that people are starting to get this software. It's, it's relatively affordable, and it's user-friendly. It used to be, a lot of it was developed for radiologists and radiology software, and then they entered the radiation therapy market, and so we're learning how it's a better image viewer, but it's useful for image manipulation more than our treatment planning system is. Talk a little bit about that later. Okay. Let me move on here. So a lot of these softwares, both the treatment planning software and the, I'm sorry, my screen just stopped showing there, and, and the third-party systems are going to have automatic fusion buttons. And with these fusion buttons, it's really easy to just press it and be done with your image fusion. Hopefully everyone understands that this is not this easy of a process, really. These are really handy buttons, and sometimes they work. 
perfectly and you don't need to make any adjustments, but sometimes they don't. So if there's anything you take out of this webinar today, it's, you know, don't, don't just press the easy button, the automatic fusion button, and assume that everything's going to be fine. We really need to, to do some QA or to check each one of your registration results. The big thing that hey, what, I think about, what, Wes, yes. do you yep. know to close the poll? Oh, no. Let me, let me go yep, do just, that. Close the poll. Okay. How about that? Yep, there you go. Okay, so we're back here. So I assume you hadn't seen the screen. So there's sometimes an automatic fusion button. And I just caution you by pressing that. It might make your life easier, but it's going to make it more difficult. So one example would be in the brain. If you have a stereotactic program and you generally the MRIs are going to do a good job in the brain of fusing with the CTs. But when we're, we're treating on the order of a millimeter, the, we're really relying on this algorithm to do a perfect job. So we're going to need you to, we need everyone to check these results really closely so that we're within a millimeter or two of where we need to be. And sometimes we're not going to be able to use the fusion because maybe there was too much motion in one of the studies or something like that. It's not a black box process. It does require thought. What is image registration? Well, it's simply the alignment of two different image sets. And these images can be two-dimensional, they can be three-dimensional, like a CT, or they can be adding the fourth dimension of time. A lot of people have 4D CT scanners, and you can use it for that, too. Endosymmetry, basically, two different image sets are more useful when they share a common coordinate space. So sometimes this can be achieved by acquiring these images at the same time, by scanning the patient in, for example, a PET CT scanner, where they're in the same position and share the same DICOM coordinate space. But more, more often than not, that's not the case. And you're going to get two separate images from two separate scanners. And they need to be mapped together into the same coordinate system, almost always your reference CT for treatment planning. So what are some uses of image registration? Well, it turns out we're not the only people that are interested in using this. It's used for military automatic target recognition. So as a, a missile's honing in on its target, it's going to be taking pictures out the front of the missile, and it's going to be registering those images with some reference image as it hones in. And it's, it's a very similar algorithm. Computer vision, so you may have heard of these Google goggles or things like that where it's going to register an, a known image in the database, a Google image of some sort, with an image that is acquired from these goggles, and that's another form of image registration. Satellite image compilation, so as you imagine, um, as, as satellite images have to be pieced together, it's usually multiple images that are taken. Where those, where those regions of overlap are between the images, an image registration algorithm is going to show, is going to help to parse them together. Okay. Photography. So this is kind of a neat picture on the right. Uh, this is a picture uh, of the Himalayan mountains, and they're about 500 miles away from where the photographer was. And when they took one picture, you couldn't see the mountains. But if they, this photographer took many, many pictures, hundreds of pictures in a row, and then automatically fused them together, and with all that information, they ended up being able to see the mountains in the background. It's a little bit of art as well. But today, of course, we're going to be talking about radiation oncology and how do we use image fusion. We use it to visualize, delineate structures. We use it to set up the patient before treatment. So people are probably using some sort of IGRT or a cone beam CT to align your patient. We use it to evaluate the treatment response. So we can be looking at a tumor size as it shrinks during treatment by registering the images. We can correlate serial scans to provide information on internal organs. So this is talking about sort of a 4D CT scanner. You're looking at essentially 10 different CTs for something like that. Those are serial scans, and they're all going to be lined up together, and you'll be able to see the motion of your target. And that will help you delineate your treatment margins for something like stereotactic body radiotherapy. So in terms of registering the two images, how can we do this? Well, one way is to do it manually. This is commonly used for cone beam CT or IGRT. When, especially when you just have three degrees of freedom. And what I mean by that is that you're not taking rotations into account. So 
the operator or the therapist or whoever is running this image match is going to visually inspect it and make adjustments. So usually you just have a little hand tool and you can pan side to side, up and down, left to right. This is an example of cone beam CT overlaying a reference CT. And then this is an example of what that would look after. This is just a manual registration. And manual is pretty easy, especially when you're not doing rotations. When you start doing rotations, it gets a little more complicated. Another type of manual registration is if you're clicking points on two-dimensional images. So this would be if you had implanted maybe, this is an example of a prostate. If you implant some gold seeds, you can click on each individual fiducial and do a, a fiducial set, uh, fiducial type image registration. You can also do that in a 3D image. So here's an example of a couple of uh, gold coils inside of a prostate. You can click either in the center of these coils or maybe on the tips of the coils and do this is still considered manual image registration because it's just using the points that you're clicking manually. Then there's semi-automatic image registration. This is if maybe you only had two seeds, but you really need a minimum of three seeds in the prostate or in any 3D image to do a proper match. So you might get started with two and then have the auto algorithm kick in after that. Or perhaps maybe you do a manual panning of the images to get them close and then click the automatic registration button. And then lastly, there's, there is fully automatic, where you just load the images up and press the button. And this always goes with the, the caveat, so don't forget to check your results. Okay, now I'm gonna get into a little more technical detail on these algorithms and go over a little bit of vocabulary. You might uh, be hearing this if you have some of this software. So an automatic registration method is, is basically two things. It's a transform and a cost function. So what'll happen is, the images are mapped to each other with a transform, and the cost function is a numeric score that defines how good your match was. You're gonna have two different kinds of registration methods. One is gonna be intensity-based, and one's gonna be feature-based. So intensity-based is essentially using all the voxels and all the images, and it's gonna calculate the quality of the match based on the entire image set. And feature-based is if you're only gonna use a limited amount of information inside that image. So one example that we talked about a second ago was the fiducial. So if you're clicking on fiducials, another example is if you're defining curves, maybe curves around a pelvic bone can be defined manually and matched that way. You can also uh, have your software that can do boundary detection and find curves and do your match that way. So these are two different types of registration methods. And then there's the optimizer. So typically when you're doing an auto registration, you will, you'll have a transform then you'll have that cost function that'll score your match, and then you have to re-optimize. You have to do it over and over again until you get the best result. So here's the process for that. You're gonna do an optimization, then you're gonna test the results by using the cost function, and typically a lower score means a better match. Then you're gonna do more optimization, more testing of the results, and then you're gonna repeat that until the results don't get any better. Sometimes you can see this on the screen as it's going. Sometimes it's in the background. Uh, it can take, it can be very quick, less than a second, or it can take up to a minute or more, depending on what algorithm you're using. Sometimes the, as a user, you can stop the optimization process. If you see a match that, that looks really good, you don't think it's gonna get any better and it's just chugging away, you can, you can press the pause or the halt button. Sometimes you may find that your optimizer uh, doesn't really work that well. And what happens is sometimes it can find a local minima. And this is when an optimizer sort of finds a result that really isn't the best result. It gets, uh, think of it as getting stuck in a rut, you know, and sometimes it's way off and sometimes it's kind of close to where it needs to be, but it's in a rut. So in these cases, you can maybe, maybe pan things manually and then try reinitiating the optimizer. The optimizer can be rigid or deformable. So you can, you can do these images just with six degrees of, of motion, or you can start deforming individual voxels to a new location. The optimizer is sometimes usually going to start with something simple. An example might be it starts with simple translations, then it's going to allow rotations, then light deformations, and finally the fully deformed model. Okay, more of the process of using optimization would be the ability to crop before you do your fusion or your registration. So here's a little example showing an MRI on the left that was scanned with the patient on a curved tabletop, and on the right, they're on a flat tabletop. But we're interested in mapping 
the, the prostate itself, this looks like it was a post-seed implant CT and MRI. So all we really want to analyze is the area around the prostate and the rectum. So in this case, you would use a little cropping area that just matches the area inside that box. And most registration software has the capability of letting the user do this. I'd say that this is important to think about this. Every time you do a registration, you're hardly ever going to really be using the entire image set. Sometimes out of convenience, you might just use the whole thing. But so use, use these cropping boxes. They have different names. They might be called clip boxes or cropping areas or, or box-based registration. Uh, they, and sometimes, actually, uh, the software allow you to, to find something other than a box. You can actually draw a contour, maybe draw a shape around the prostate so that it's only using that area. So the example here was an MRI to a CT. So registration versus fusion. There's a little subtle difference between the vocabulary here, and it's really easy to use the same word all the time. I think the proper, the proper terminology would be that registration is going to be the alignment of two images, and data fusion or image fusion is a superposition of these two images or data once they're aligned. So this graphic on the bottom shows sort of what I'm referring to here. There's an MRI, MRI on the bottom left, and there's an original uh, PET CT on the top. So when we line these images up, the alignment of the two images is called registration. But when we combine the data and show them as one image, that's called data fusion or image fusion. So in this case, the user has actually combined these two images and saved it as one image. Okay, so that's two registered images fused into one. In this case, the, they wanted to see information from both the MRI and the PET. And you can see there's a little red ring around a lesion there. So that's the, disting that's the distinction between registration and image or data fusion. This is another graphic showing a little bit of that. Um, basically, when you line this MRI on the left up with the CT on the right, so that would be the registration of those images, you can fuse the data or the contours that may have been drawn on the MRI onto the CT. This is called mapping structures. So what type of image, image registration? Well, one of the easiest is to do the same type of image modality, serial studies, CT to CT. But more, most often, we're trying to combine multimodalities. These uh, are a little bit more difficult for the algorithm to handle, MRI to CT, PET to CT, PET to MRI, things like that, because basically it's difficult to find common features. So in the past decade, most of the, the newest image registration algorithms are going to be using something called mutual information method. There are other methods that are used, and every mutual information method is going to be a little different, but I want to I want to briefly talk about this mutual information method because it's good to know how your algorithm's working. So Khan has a treatment planning book, and this is a, one of the sentences from his books. It says, while different regions may have different distributions of intensity in two different image modalities, it is generally true that the relationship between these two intensities is predictable and consistent. So here's a graphic, it's a little fuzzy here, sorry, showing an MRI on the left and a CT on the right, and just sort of pointing out the obvious, air is dark in both images. But if you look at bone, it's going to be light in the CT and dark in the MRI. So certain structures are going to not have the same grayscale brightness in both of these images. But what we do know is that there hopefully is a relationship that most of the darks should line up with the, most of the brights for bone. And how we're going to use that and create what's called a joint histogram here. And I'm going to show you guys this. You don't need to memorize this or fully digest this little histogram here today. But I want to show it to you because I got it. This happened to be a, an ABR oral examine, examination board sort of a question, uh, question for me. So the examiner came in and just threw this image up. And man, you know, I recognized it from the book as being something to do with image registration and mutual information, but I had a really hard time explaining what this was. So I'm going to try a little bit here. It may take a couple times to digest it, like I said, but basically you've got CT intensity here on the x-axis and MR intensity on that y-axis, and the little arrows are pointing up where there's a lot of voxels that align. So 
if, if you were doing a CT to a CT, you would see all these little arrows lining up in a row because all the, all the grayscales are going to be the same from one image set to another and it would be easy to align things. But this particular histogram is for an MRI with a CT. Now, what it, you see are these little arrows which show the spikes where the, basically where the dark fox, so for bone, you'll see a little B comma B on the bottom right side of the histogram. That's where some of the dark intensities for CT or MR show up with the bright intensities of CT. Now, if the images were slightly aligned, some of the bone voxels are going to map the brain voxels. And another little peak would show up in this histogram. So if things are misaligned, you're going to end up with lots of peaks on this histogram. And if things are perfectly aligned, you're going to end up with a few peaks that are really strong, showing a strong correlation of some mutual information. Okay, and what we do is then this histogram is analyzed for its entropy, or that's basically a lack of order. This is something that's taught in thermodynamics. But, it, but basically, the more orderly that histogram looks, the better of a match it is, and that's how your optimizer works. Okay, so enough of that. When mutual information is scarce, so in a PET CT, uh, there really is not a lot of mutual information, then we like to acquire these images in identical orientation in a common DICOM center. We use this a lot in radiation therapy because it's hard, if not uh, almost impossible, in your, to use your algorithm to line up a PET in a CT that came from different CT scanners. So really few algorithms do an adequate job at this. We assume there's no transform between these two modalities. But don't be fooled, there can still be some motion between the PET and the CT. You remember that when you acquire these pets, it takes several minutes, whereas the CT happens in several seconds. What, what also means, this means is if there is motion, adjustments after the fact are quite difficult. Here's an example of something that we see quite often where the CT is acquired and then the pet is acquired afterwards and you end up with bladder filling. So this was for, I believe, a rectal carcinoma, and it's just tough to know how much movement there was between the CT and the pet. But you can't really go around and do a manual adjustment because you may be adjusting off of something that's moved. And then the rest of the image was stationary. So this is just a word of caution to watch out for. Okay, now I'm going to move into, up to this point we've talked about just deformable, I'm sorry, rigid registration. Now I'm going to move into a little bit of talking about deformable registration. So I'm going to launch this poll here to see if anyone is using deformable registration. Okay, so it looks like as the results are still coming in, about three-quarters of the audience, or two-thirds of the audience, around 70%, are not using deformable registration. And that's about what I would expect, because most of the treatment planning systems, which it sounds like most of you are using, to do your registration don't really have deformable registration capabilities. Now, the deformable registration capabilities are coming quickly, though. I wouldn't be surprised if most of you have this ability in the next year or two. If you have third-party software, that's probably why you bought it, was so you could use some of this deformable registration. So let's talk a little bit about that. You might see the abbreviation DIR for deformable image registration. This isn't to be confused with what you're using as regular old rigid image registration. There's many algorithms that are available. I'm not even going to really go through them all. You know, most of those happen under the hood anyways, so you're not going to ever be tweaking many variables in those algorithms. The multi multimodality capabilities are still a little bit lacking for deformable registration, so you're, you're not going to see many people deforming an MRI to a CT. In fact, some of the softwares companies have sort of had a rule where they won't do that until actually lately they've changed a little bit. The commissioning and validation, now we're going to have to actually start figuring out if your deformable registration is working right. Uncertainties, you at least need to know about them or incorporate them into the process. And deformable registration can end up sort of going cross-eyed sometimes. When you're deforming one CT to another, your structures are deforming back and forth. Maybe you introduce a third CT. Um, you're going to see dramatic changes in a tumor. So what do you do when it deforms for a few centimeters away? Can you actually deform that dose or those structures properly? So let's talk a little bit about that. 
Here's an example, a graphic of what a deformable registration may look like between an image on the left and the right here. Just different lung motion on the same patient with a diaphragm that's pushing up. And so you can kind of see this is a B-splines fusion. And you can see the little rigid squares on the left, that grid pattern turns non-rigid on the right. And, it, and there's a transform that can map the voxels on the left to the voxels on the right. So this is more than just rigid fusion. This is deformable fusion. Here's another way of, of presenting this to the user who's deforming two images. So there's an image on the left and a right, same patient, head and neck, different um, days during treatment. So this is called the fluid flow model where you can see little arrows showing how much each voxel was deformed. So some areas are the same. So you see these really teeny tiny arrows that are blue and then some areas had to be deformed quite a bit. You can see right around the throat or the trachea there where it's deforming these huge vectors. So that sort of alerts you right away that there's quite a difference between these two images. Now, why, why do we like deformable registration? Well, once it's deformably registered properly, the structures and associated dose can also be deformed. And this can save you lots of time and make everyone smile back in dose symmetry because you might not have to totally recontour a head and neck or something like that. It also opens the door for, like I said, automatic recontouring. You can also accumulate dose from a from a previously treated patient, and it opens the door for adaptive radiotherapy as well. So what are some of the practical applications? Now we're going to move on from the technical here and get a little more practical uh, on how you can use registration for treatment planning, how you might be able to use registration and deformable registration for retreatments, and how it might make your life a little more automated. So first, planning software. It sounded like about Three-quarters of you or two-thirds of you are using treatment planning systems. They offer a limited range of image registration tools. Quite often you can only view two images at a time. But they're starting to incorporate more deformable fusion algorithms. So I think on the horizon you're going to get some more capabilities. There's, they've been mostly developed as an afterthought to the primary purpose of your treatment planning system, which is to calculate dose to the patient. So I don't really blame them for not having all the image tools there. And they are often limited to axial images. So some planning systems will allow you to import, say, a coronal MRI or a sagittal MRI. But for the most part, you can only use axial images. Whereas third-party imaging, which is developed just to handle these images, um, examples of these products are called MEM software, Velocity. There's some other products after, out there. And typically, these are standalone workstations. They're going to sit back in dosimetry or somewhere in your department. They're going to have a separate database for the patients, so you'll have to export and import from your treatment planning system. So that's definitely a downside to having one of these, a separate database, a lot of transferring back and forth. And if, a big thing is if you make a change to a contour in one of these third-party imaging softwares, then you, you know, it's not going to be reflected necessarily in your treatment planning system. But they do offer a lot of additional image analysis tools. So let's start very basic for treatment planning. A basic use of image registration is to, view, is to register an MRI with a CT using your mutual information algorithm. Now in this case, I would, I would probably always use a rigid fusion. And the reason for this is, is multifold. I mean, first of all, it's, there's not a lot of mutual information inside the brain for an algorithm to be able to do a deformable fusion. It, it's hard to see brain folds on the CT with your eyes or the algorithm can't see it either. So that's the first reason. And the second reason why you wouldn't want to use deformable is that the brain is pretty much secured by the skull. So you don't expect there to be any motion in there. And for those two reasons, we must always use a, a rigid fusion or a rigid image registration match. You'll want to do your registration first and then start contouring on your CT image and viewing your MRI image. And what that means is you're contouring in the correct coordinate space for treatment planning. And the reason I mentioned order, because order does matter sometimes when you're, when you're registering multiple images. So do you see this image on the right? I hope this shows up for everyone. This is an example of some contour that I don't need to pay attention about exactly what was contoured here, but look at the shape of these contours. They're kind of, they're kind of chunky and choppy, especially the brainstem. And it looks like 
you know, someone had a really bad mouse pad or something while they were contouring that. But what that was was actually a very nicely contoured brainstem on an MRI, but that MRI hadn't been registered yet with the CT. So what happened here was this is a patient that we were treating for stereotactic radio surgery. They had gotten an MRI in a neutral head position because, like most of you, our, our head masks won't fit into the MRI scanner. And when they're in a neutral head position, they had about a 10-degree head tilt uh, different than what they were when we brought them back for a CT simulation. Well, we had this MRI before we even did the CT simulation. It was up to the tree, and the neurosurgeon was down, and they wanted to look at it. And they decided, hey, we, we want to treat this. So they went ahead and drew all their contours. And then the patient came back for their simulation CT. We registered the MRI and the contours to the CT, but after there was a 10-degree head tilt that was introduced, and we were in our CT DICOM reference frame for planning, then all of a sudden all the contours started to look choppy. In fact, it was so bad that it was unacceptable. And the reason why is after you rotate 10 degrees, your contours are now going to be split apart on a, you know, 10 or 15 different CT images, and it has to interpolate between those contours. And it's not a perfect interpolation, and it ends up looking choppy. So this is when order does matter. In a case like this, we really needed to wait for that CT simulation, register the MRI, and then draw our contours. Now, you may find that sometimes this is worse than others, depending on how, how off your registration was to begin with. So the patient was in a neutral head position, then we brought them in for simulation, and they had a 10 degree difference. So Now, sometimes maybe just one MRI isn't good enough. So sometimes in our department, we'll have a T1 with contrast we like, and then we need to use a T2 flare or another T2 in addition. So we can register each one of those MRIs with the CT. So now we have three registered images with the CT being the reference coordinate frame. And it's useful to be able to view both of these MRIs side by side. So some of this, these new software out packages out there are going to allow you to do this. So as the physician contours on one, maybe the image on the left, the contours are going to show up simultaneously on the right. This is, can be very useful for treatment planning. And the physicians are really happy to be able to see all these images in a row as they draw our contour, being able to see it simultaneously, as opposed to maybe toggling back and forth between the images. Okay, retreatments. We see more and more of these, especially for head and neck patients. Of course, we're going to see them for all sorts of patients, IMRT patients with tons of structures that were drawn originally. What we're going to do is we're going to register that old treatment planning CT to a new CT, and this can be really helpful for planning. So I'm going to show you guys a, an example of a stereotactic treatment from our department. This is a post-surgical bed where there was a, le a lesion we treated, and you can see it on the MR on the right. The green is the CTV and the yellow is the PTV in the brain stem, and then the, and then the aligned CT on the left. So the patient came back, uh, I think this was about a year and a half later, for um, more surgery, or no, they could not get more surgery. They had a new enhancing area, and we were considering maybe radio surgery again or some sort of treatment. So what we did was we took a new MRI, and we registered that and a new CT, and we registered the old CT and MRI to the new CT. So now we have basically four different images registered, and the new CT is the new reference frame. Now once that happened, we could fuse those old contours onto the new MRI. So you can see here the old lesion that was treated is just shown up as a contour, uh, and then we have new contours. So another option is we could have shown dose here, but sometimes it's useful just to visualize where the previously treated area was. So, like I said, we could use dose accumulation as well. In this case, we can deform the dose with the old CT to the new CT. This is helpful for the root treatments. So the process is basically you deformably register your old CT to the new one, you fuse the old dose, and you fuse the structures, and then you check your results. So sometimes we'll find out that this, this just doesn't work, right? It's not the algorithm's bad, but we just maybe had too much too much change in the anatomy from the old treatment to the new treatment. You can convert those doses once you have them on the new CT. Uh, so oftentimes we'll just convert those to isodose lines and then use that for treatment planning. Some systems might actually be able to handle that, those new doses and use them as, as bias doses in a new IMRT plan. That could be really useful as well. Okay, here's an example. 
this patient came to our department in 2007, and we treated them for a right chest wall superclav. This is pretty standard tangent fields here, showing some isodose lines. Then in, in 2010, they came back, and this patient had a right chest wall mass, and we treated that with IMRT. So here are the isodose lines from that treatment. Now, at that time, we didn't have any deformable fusion algorithms. We weren't able to take the previous uh, chest wall superclav treatment into account. So this is the new plan, and that was the old plan, and they were separate. Then the patient came back a couple years later, so this was the end of last year, 2012, and they needed to get, uh, they had a lesion on their T-spine. And unfortunately, that was sort of right under these old lesions that we had treated, and we really wanted to know how much of an overlap region do we have of those double treatments. So now, because we know in some areas this patient probably got 100 gray. So here's the results. So this patient, this is the third CT. So the patient came back in 2012. In this example, we deformed the original 2007 to the new CT. We deformed the 2010 to the new CT. And shown here is the accumulated dose from both those previous treatments. And what can we do with that? Well, we can make sure our, our T-spine treatment is staying away from the areas that the physician wants to. So a reminder here, the newest CT is always the reference coordinate space, because otherwise you're going to end up with uh, the wrong CT being your reference. So this, is a, this was a really useful case to use it on. Here is another picture of another patient that we had where we had a sort of a rib mass that we treated with IMRT. They came back and we treated them for a T-spine, and then they came back a third time for some sort of L-spine treatment. And, and we were able to take, this was the first two treatments we gave them. We deformed the doses to the third CT as well. So this is a lot like that last case. But what I wanted to show you here was a couple of things that you can see. You can see the isodose lines are a little lumpy for that APPA T-spine treatment. And that sort of makes sense, right, because the anatomy is not all the same. But you have to sort of take your results of these deformable fusions with a grain of salt. So not want to necessarily take it literally. The dose may have been delivered there and some anatomy moved, or maybe the algorithm had a problem with that area. The algorithm doesn't do that well in areas that are really homogeneous. And also in this case, we didn't actually sum up our total doses. We just sort of showed the isodose lines on the same image set. So you can see that overlap region didn't add the dose together. It just shows those separate isodose lines. So just this is sort of when you want to be careful about your deformable image fusions. Sometimes it'll just stick right out at you that it didn't go that well. Okay, so now I did a couple polling questions earlier about what you guys have. Now I'm going to do a polling question to make sure everyone's still awake. So here's just kind of a little quiz question for you here. We're going to have two of these. Okay, so in what situation would you expect deformable registration to be the most effective? Okay, looks like a lot of the results are in, and most people have chosen D or A. Okay, let's see. I believe my presentation... Okay, here we are. Most people chose D or A. So let's walk through these here. Okay, first of all, I'm glad you guys didn't answer B because that's the easy one to get rid of. A brain MRI to a CT, like we mentioned, there's not a lot of mutual information so it's hard to do a deformable fusion. Okay, D is a long CT with the arms up to a long CT with the arms down. Now, if you misread that and you just saw two long CTs, yeah, two long CTs are fine, but when you have arms up and arms down, this is going to be tricky. Now, what you can do is if you can set your cropping area to exclude the arms, then you might actually come up with a pretty good match. But you know, there's a lot of anatomy that can change around when they pull those arms up and down. So this is one where you would want to be careful. I'd say that's probably not the best answer here. Uh, pelvis CT with and without contrast. Now, this is an interesting one because I would, I would say a, a year ago I would have said, oh, no, you can't do deformable registration very easily at all with, with contrast and without contrast. But it turns out 
Um, I wouldn't write it off 100% of the time because some of these algorithms are actually doing a good job of taking this into account. But in general, you guys are right that you would not want to use deformable registration with and without contrast. So then that leaves a, a planning chest CT with a mid-treatment course re-CT. So this is assuming the patient's in the same position. This is a great example of when you would want to use deformable registration. Great. Auto segmentation. So what this means is you can redraw your original contours on a new CT. This can be a really valuable aid to treatment planning. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit. So here's an example. This is an original CT. This one isn't in your handout because we actually just came across this case yesterday in our clinic. I took a couple of screen captures. This was an original CT of a liver that we treated with IMRT. Then they came in yesterday. Um, this was we, we noticed in a daily comium CT that it looks like some anatomy had changed or the, the liver was shrinking and, and this we couldn't treat them like this. So we, we put them back on the CT scanner for another simulation yesterday and we registered the two images with fusion or with rigid registration so we didn't do any deformable fusion and this shows the original contours overlay, overlaying the new CT and you can see obviously we were off. Now in this case you can see the spinal cord is okay, the kidneys are looking pretty good in terms of their alignment, but that, that CTV is pretty far off. So we thought, well what if we deformably register this and maybe save everyone some time, because we're definitely going to have to replan this with IMRT, so let's just deform those old contours to new contours. Well, what you might find, what we found here was that the, the spinal cord contours deformed quite well, but Nothing else really did that great. You can see the kidneys, the patient's right kidney there in brown. It looks pretty good, but the, the left kidney, you can see a little bump kind of spreading out into bowel there. So we had to redo basically both kidneys. And then the CTV was a somewhat useful starting point, but by the time we showed the physician, the, there was enough anatomy that changed in there where it was contouring bowel and contouring some air pockets, and, and it actually was, it was more useless than it was useful. <laughs> because because it, it, it was staring us in the screen and it was kind of confusing the physician on where the actual lesion was, so we just deleted that. So this is a case where you might think, oh, I'm going to use our new deformable registration algorithm, and, and you know, it just isn't going to be that useful, and you're going to end up wasting more time than you actually would have done otherwise. Okay, so now here's another example. This was an original CT of a lung lesion shown in green. We've got esophagus in purple, trachea in red, spinal cord. This was mid-treatment. We did a new CT, and we deformed the registration from the old to the new, and with that, we deformed the contours as well. And so you can see here, actually all the structures look pretty good. So this saved us buckets of time by not having to recontour all these structures, and the CTV, in this particular case, the physician liked it. They just went in and, and tweaked a couple little edges on it, and it was great. So this one saved us a, a lot of time. Here's a third example of automatic recontouring. So this is an original planning CT here again, another lung lesion. We've got the heart and the lungs contoured and the spinal cord. This was a new CT. This one actually had contrast, so we thought there's no way this is going to work, uh, deforming the old CT to the new CT. But amazingly, we did see that it, it contoured the lungs great. Okay, so this is after the deformable fusion was done and we, we brought the new contours over with that transform, the lungs were great. So we didn't have to recontour the lungs again. The cord was great. But you can see that CTV that originally was sort of in the patient's right lung has gone all over the place. And it's now deformed itself way over into the left lung and was entirely off. So this was a case where we were able to use the deformation from that deformable registration to save us time for contouring criticals, but it was really no use for the, the CTV. So this is where uh, different cases can, can work better than others for this. Okay, now let's see if you can remember the first part of the presentation here where we talked about mutual information methods. So this is just another, this is your last polling question, a little quiz question on, on the mutual information method. How does it work? Okay, 
So the results are mostly in. It looks like we got about 80% of you guys saying C is the correct answer. A few people saying A is the correct answer and a couple saying B. So let's look at this here. I'm going to close the poll. The mutual information method of image registration works in the following way. The correct answer is C. It uses grayscale voxels to map between image sets. Now remember, they, they aren't the same grayscales, but they're going to hopefully map to this, a similar relationship in both image sets. Answers A and B are, are non-mutual information. Those are using, that's what we talked about earlier for, um, for structure-based mapping. So contours and fiducial markers end up being more the manual method that's only going to use a limited part of your image set, okay? And the mutual information method is really using the entire image set. So remember grayscale values to, to determine a map. Okay, deforming MRIs. Now we've talked about how nice it is to deform an old CT to a new CT, but what about MRIs? Why, why should, what do we need to think about with those now? I have to say, we've got to be very careful with these. So historically, we don't really deform MRIs to CT sets due to that lack of mutual information. An example of this is in the brain. Like I mentioned before, brain folds are barely discernible in the CT, and the defu deformable fusion algorithm is going to break down. Now in other areas like the spine, you may be able to use this deformable fusion algorithm, and each algorithm is going to handle it differently. I know the software that we have uh, is able to do that now. As of just a month ago, they incorporated that feature, but it's pretty complicated. You have to zoom in in several different areas, and it, I mean, it takes uh, 20, 30 minutes to really do one of these, but it can be very useful. So this is where you're going to have to probably sit down in dosimetry with a couple people and work this out the first couple times. It may involve some additional commissioning and QA. And, you know, when I, when I talk about QA, I don't necessarily mean the physicist setting up a phantom and doing a QA test on it. QA for image registration can be a lot of visual verification that your fusions happen correctly. Mentioned a little bit about contrast before. Algorithms are going to handle this in different ways. Intuition tells you to be careful, and sometimes it just won't work at all. Sometimes you can set your clip box or your cropping area in a way to exclude the contrast. And sometimes, most of the time, you're just going to use manual registration methods for this. So you'll see this a lot for uh, cone beam CT alignment or daily setup verification because oftentimes the, the reference CT for planning was uh, where, when the patient had contrast in their bladder or in some blood vessels or in the heart. So, and, and then every single day after that, you're going to try to register an image for treatment where they don't have that. So oftentimes, you'll just use the manual registration for those. Adaptive therapy. We've got, now we've got daily images for our patients with cone beam CT or, or an MRI maybe. Uh, there, there's going to be more and more imaging daily. So what do you do with them? Well, in principle, you can deform these daily images with our planning image and then automatically recontour the lesions or the targets and the criticals. You can actually add dose from the previous fractions. You can recalculate your dose with the current plan in your current image for the day, and then compare the DVH to the original DVH, and then make an automatic decision on whether or not to proceed. If the treatment needs to be adapted, then you can automatically replan, recalculate, and then review your results. And I'm pretty sure nobody here is doing anything close to this, and, and that's fine. No one really is. But this is, this is in the future, I think. And you could deliver a brand new plan right on the fly. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful, but yet a little bit frightening at the same time? So this is the future. Uh, we haven't really, don't have all the tools yet to be able to do this, but this is, image registration is a huge part of this process on making this happen. So what would you need? You'd need images, first of all. You'd need very good image registration software. You'd need an ability to recalculate your dose quickly on the fly, sum your dose, some sort of decision-making tool. So would it be DVH-based, maybe? some pass-fail criteria, maybe it's biological based. Then you have to re-optimize your plan on the fly. That's usually something that takes quite a while for an IMRT plan. So, so who has all these tools to do this? Well, right now only some universities are able to do this, but it's still, it could be at our own clinics in the future. Some of the caveats to adaptive therapy, auto-contouring might be efficient, you know, by pressing the auto-contour button, but 
you're going to need the viewer to probably modify the results. So there's always going to be some thinking probably involved uh, from, from whoever's at the console. And a totally automatic procedure, it's, you're still going to make sure, you're going to have to ensure that everyone in the department is okay with that contour uncertainty, right? There's different positions have different ways of contouring lesions and targets. So, so that's going to, we're going to have to work that out before we can implement it. Here's an example of sort of a theoretical adaptive radiotherapy treatment. A head and neck at the top left image is, is a planning image. Image B is maybe a daily image uh, later in treatment where this lesion has shrunk. And then image C would be overlaying that dose from the original image on the new image and then showing a, compa a, a comparison deviation on the bottom having to make a decision on whether or not to treat that day. And, you know, some people may have this capability to do this. Some may not. But this is sort of what a typical process would look like for sort of an image-guided radiotherapy process. Okay, 40 cone beam CT. More uses of image registration. What is a 40 CT? If you don't have one, this is the scan lasts a few minutes. You end up with 10 different volumes with Typically, we use them for lung lesions or maybe pancreas or liver, showing the motion. It's a motion study. You sort each one of those CTs into bins depending on the amplitude of the motion over breathing. It gives you information at several points in time. It does. You do have to assume that your respiratory motion was the same, is going to be the same for treatment as it was during the CT scan, so that's a little caveat there. Uh, oftentimes, it's used to create your internal target volume for a stereotactic body treatment, SBRT. People are going to make gating decisions based off of this information from a 4D CT. This is a graphical display of, of a sort of a standard CT on the top four images and a 4D CT on the bottom four images showing a, an actual lesion that was spherical, a computer-generated lesion. What it would look like on a regular CT scan on the top, we're all used to seeing uh, our lung look kind of like that on our, on our CTs when it gets parsed over several breathing cycles. And on the bottom shows that lesion being, able, being captured and binned at different phases of respiratory motion so that you can get a better handle of what your lesion looks like and where it is at different points in time. So why are we talking about this with image fusion or image registration? Well, you can use it in two different ways. So one thing is to create the maximum intensity projection or your MIP image. What you have to do is take those 10 images from individual phases. So you see this little graphic I have here. On the left, you see a very small lung lesion and one little phase of motion. And on the right, you see basically the lesion, that same lesion in all phases of motion. And that's the MIP image. And basically, that's the registration and fusion of 10 different CTs. So it's fused into one image and then oftentimes you'll save that, send it to your planning system and now you are ready to do your treatment planning. So that's a fused image. You can also use this if someone is contouring on one of those individual 10 CTs, you can, let's say they're contouring the liver. Well, you can use a deformable registration algorithm and recontour that liver on all the phases of motion. And wouldn't that be handy for speeding up the contouring process? So that's how registration would be used with a 40 CT. Commissioning and QA, well, it's not like a LINAC. So your physicists might be scratching their head. Algorithms don't really rely on fundamental physics. The accuracy can have a pretty big impact in treatment planning. Uh, definitely in the areas that are less, uh, that are more homogeneous, it has a harder time finding a match. Validation remains a little subjective, meaning it's sort of user, user dependent. There are physical and digital phantoms available, and you can imagine one of them is sort of shaped like a tin can uh, filled with some gel. You do a CT of it, oh, a gel, and maybe some BBs in the gel. And then once you've CT'd it, you press a plunger on one end of that tin can, squish everything together, and re-CT it, and you deformably fuse those two images and essentially compare with what's expected from the manufacturer. So that's a, a way to use a physical phantom to to validate your deformable fusion algorithm. Or maybe you're given two sets of digital images from someone and, and there's a certain criteria on how well they fuse with using your algorithm. And one thing to remember is you may have different results by fusing on one system than another system. Uh, this has been published that this is very well known fact. So 
you may have one algorithm that you like the result from and one you don't, or maybe you like them both and you're not sure which one to use and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to just zoom in and, and, and make a group decision on that. There are um, also site-specific QA algorithms that you might want to do. Maybe some sites are uh, more complicated than other sites. So what would a sort of a hypothetical commissioning process be? First, you need to understand it. Use some phantom to understand it a little more. Quantitatively evaluate it. Get some numbers out of the system. How many millimeters off are you? And then document and evaluate. But honestly, there's not a lot of tools out yet. And, and the task troops, for, at least from our physics organizations, are still figuring out the best way to do this. So if everyone's scratching their heads when you get this, that's OK, I say. <laughs> Because honestly, we, you know, we acquired this software, and then I went to a conference where they talked about QAing the software, and even I was scratching my head, sort of thinking, wow, I, I, I guess I need to, to look at this a little bit more. I'm not sure our algorithm's working perfect. So sort of a word of warning. One, one test you can do is you can do what's called inverse consistency test. You can deform or register one image to another, and then register that image right back. And you should get the same you should get the same image in both of those. But if you don't, then, then there might be something to look into. But really, this is a simple test. It's not going to really help you with all of your algorithms. But it can give you an idea on the robustness of it. Another way to QA your results, you can use a split screen display. You guys are probably used to using that. You can toggle back and forth from each individual set every one second. You can use sort of what I call the green-purple overlay between the two sets. And that's what we, uh, where I showed you before. Here's the green purple overlay before and the green purple after. So on the left you see, you can see lots of green and purple. On the right, you don't see lots of green and purple, you see more white. So white means you have a good match. Okay, this is an example of sort of the Electa vendor way of um, displaying the cone beam CT matching. And other vendors have different ways of doing this, different colors. But the concept is still similar. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is sort of a new type of image registration, which is going to be using surface image registration. So this isn't the entire CT get set. This is just maybe the surface of the patient. Uh, but it's still a 3D map is created at simulation. You can derive it from your CT scanner and your patient contour. And then on the treatment table, that patient surface is going to be measured with the, the camera, lasers and a camera. It's going to be brought into congruence or registered with that 3D reference set. And then the patient can be set up for treatment. One thing to remember is you're only looking at surface anatomy here. It's still a surrogate for the target. But, but if, it, if it, the assumption holds, it is an accurate method to position the patient. So this is sort of another use of image registration. So I think it looks like we're at slide 61 or 61. So that brings us to the end. And now I think if there's any questions, we can answer those. So I'm going to look at the question box here. OK. So Spencer, let's see. I see some questions. And most of them are related to the polling screen. Oh, OK. Here's a question. It says, what is the B-spline method of registration? Well, B-spline is <laughs> it's pretty complicated. And honestly, I don't know all the details of it. Uh, but I know that there's a software vendor called Velocity. And I think they're using a little more B-spline methods. than, But it's all still mutual information. The B-spline gives, I know one thing it does is it gives penalties for for fusing things too long of a distance. And you can kind of weight those penalties, meaning uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to try to not fuse things at very long distance. It's going to keep things fairly local. You know what? I honestly don't know all the details of the B-spline med registration method. So sorry, I'm not going to be able to help that. OK, here's another, another question. It says, who mainly does your fusion? Is it the dosimetrist or the physicist? Ah, good question. So I would say that for most standard brain MRI to CT fusions, it's just the dosimetrist that'll do it, and I never go back. But for a more complicated, deformable fusion, we have sort of a department policy where, where physics always gets called back. And, and actually, there is a, uh, 
there is a billing code for, or you can charge for a special physics consult anytime a physicist uh, approves or reviews an image registration. And this, this counts. So we do this every time we have a difficult registration. And sometimes, you know, I have to encourage, I have to say, we always have a couple people there when we're doing the more complicated ones, especially when we have a, a retreatment. It may not necessarily be uh, me as a physicist back there, but at least the dosimetrist will review it with the physician and see if, if that deformable fusion makes sense and if they're all satisfied with it. So that's a good question. Okay, when your dosimetrist does the fusion, do you charge 77370? I'm not very good with the billing. Um, we don't charge anything extra except a special physics consult for image registration review. Um, so that, I guess that's the answer, is when we, when, we, when we do have a physicist in there, we'll charge for the special physics consult. Okay. Here's a question about that maximum intensity projection. How confident are you in trusting a MIP if the tumor is near the chest wall? Okay. Uh, how con oh, so uh, we don't have 40 CT in our department, so we don't. I haven't used MIP a whole lot, so I can only answer this knowing what I know about maximum intensity projection. But I assume when it's near the chest wall, and sometimes it can be fixed to the chest wall. It's not going to move as much, and as far as I know, there's really not uh, a big problem. I mean, I think you are, you know, your patient's going to be laying uh, in the same DICOM origin during all these CT scans, so you're going to have 10, 10 different scans that are put in those different bins, and your, your lesion's going to be moving more sometimes and less sometimes, so how much do you trust your MIP? Well, I guess the less it's moving, the more I trust it would be my answer. Because if, it's, if someone has erratic breathing, I may, uh, may not trust it as much either because maybe they're going to be, uh, there's still a pretty fast scan, the 40 CT, uh, you know, their breathing might change from one cycle to another enough that you might not be able to, uh, you might not be able to trust that quite as much. Okay, according, okay, we have someone who wrote in, according to experts, you cannot charge for the actual fusion. So that seems consistent with what we were just saying, that we don't charge anything extra for the fusion, but if there's a special physicist consult, that might be possible. Okay. Good questions? Let's see if there's any chat. Okay, so someone wrote in, our doctors trust the MIP, but they also have access to all the excursions when planning the, and then I don't see any after that, but so we've got um, someone that says that they do trust their MIP. Okay, how about using the average CT for planning? Okay, I think we're getting into some details about using a 4D CT scanner for treatment planning. Okay, it's a little bit less about the registration, but more about you know, what is your department process for this? And different departments may have it set up differently. Um, the, the MIP, like I showed before, is the sum of all of those CTs. So you're going to be seeing this blurred lesion that's going to look a lot bigger than it does in real life, whereas an average is going to be different than a MIP, right? The average is just averaging each voxel over all 10 of those. So you're going to have you're going to have your lesions showing up darker in some areas and lighter in other areas, whereas a MIP is possibly going to combine the maximum voxel values for all those 10 images. So they're definitely different images, and you can definitely use them in, diff you know, in similar ways, but it's going to depend on what, what your department process is, really. Something to talk about. I mean, one, one thing is the, the average CT may be a little better for doing a calculation on it, uh, it might be a little more accurate in terms of your, your, house, your, your electron densities in the area of interest, but the MIP may be more useful for just drawing uh, a contour on. Okay, so then we've got some more questions here. Someone wrote, how about using the average CT for plant fused MIP to the RTP? Not really sure what that question is. 
we do not use the average. Someone wrote in. Is third party 4D contouring preferred over treatment planning system 4D? I know that's that's a good question too. I, I don't know if it's going to make a big difference, it, but there could be ways that the third party is going to handle it in maybe a better way that gives you more tools to contour. But in, in principle, uh, there, there really isn't one that's going to be better than another unless the algorithms work differently or maybe you can view things a little differently. So that's a, that's a good question. It just depends on what, your, your, what kind of treatment planning system you had. I mean, in general, I, I think most people are using the third-party software to do a lot of the 4D contouring. Uh, but maybe it's a little inaccessible to the physicians. So you might have to just send it over to your planning system and have them back into a symmetry like they do everything else. Okay, where did you locate the best QA protocol for fusion? I found the QA protocol for fusion um, basically through, there's a medical physics, there's a publication, and I'm not looking at it right with me here, and I had it earlier in the presentation. I'm going to go back and see if I can find the reference for that. That gave me hints for, all right, let me stop this. Okay, so earlier in the presentation, I had, let's see, a reference here. Okay, Dr. Marsler, Image Registration and Date Fusion and Radiation Therapy. There's an article in the British Journal of Radiology from, oh, that was from several years ago, but that referenced some, some QA processes that I've, like QA protocol, but I would also look on the AAPM, the physicist's website, and, and do a search for image fusion because there's been, there's been a lot of publications lately on that. And there's no, as far as I know, there's not a, a task group report out right now with, with the best protocol for the formable fusions. But there should be one coming soon, so keep your eye out for that. Okay, someone has written in, instead of MIP, you can register deformably the other phases to the 0% phase, propagate the contour from the 0% phase to all the other phases and sum into an ITV. It works well for lesions at the chest wall and at the diaphragm. Okay, so that's another useful way to use that. We talked about that auto segmentation or propagating the contours, how that can be a useful tool. So this person's propagating from one phase into the other 10 phases. So now they have 10 sets of contours and then they're going to sum that into an ITV. So by summing all those contours, it's going to be similar to a MIP and that works well for the lesions at the chest wall and at the diaphragm. So this lesions at the chest wall and the diaphragm can maybe be moving a little bit more or moving in ways that are not very predictable. Okay, uh, does anyone else have any more questions today? Okay, here's a question. When you, when you fusion data, do you fuse them all, they all in three planes or just in one plane? Okay, uh, well, if it's, a, if it's a 3D image set, it's going to fuse, okay, you may be talking about, um, I'm not sure what data you're talking about. If, the, if it's the image itself, it just depends on what plane you want to view it in. But typically for treatment planning, we're going we're gonna to have to keep everything in the axial plane because that's how most of our treatment planning systems take images in the axial plane. So when in doubt, we would put it in the axial plane. But if you have, uh, for example, a, a coronal MRI, you know, you, you can import that and you can draw in the coronal plane even after it's been registered and, and still use those contours in the axial plane. So I don't think you necessarily usually specify which plane you want to fuse in. It's just going to fuse or register the entire image set and then it's a matter of what plane you want to view things in to do some contouring in. Oh, okay. Yes, that's what they meant to ask. Thank you. 
Okay, so someone wrote in, would you recommend breaking coordinate link a multiple image set MRI when fusing to a CT? Okay, I'm trying to think about what this is exactly asking. So, a coordinate link between an MRI and a CT, and that is, I'm assuming someone who's acquired maybe multiple MRIs in the same coordinate space, uh, do you want to break those individual links and fuse them individually to a CT? Well, if that's the question, um, I guess it would depend on, you know, if it looks like there was no patient motion, you can maybe rely on a common MRI coordinate center and let them all ride together. But in my opinion, I would probably break them into separate MRIs and fuse or register them individually with the CT. Uh, they, they typically do do pretty well at a, red, a rigid fusion, and if you, if you keep them all in the same coordinate space, you know, it's just going to be, are you, are you confident that, those, that in, there, in fact, wasn't much motion between those MRIs? So that's a good question, and, and we do see that sometimes, but I'd say typically for us, they come in separately, and we'll register them separately. Any more questions here? Looks like there is one more here at the bottom. Okay. There's a product out there that will allow you to load all the MR sequences, and when one is fused to the CT, they're all registered. Okay. Well, that, that answers a little bit of that last question, that it, it at least gives you the option if they're sharing a, a DICOM uh, coordinate uh, link between all those MRIs, and you fuse one, then they can all go together. So it, it depends on if your software is capable of doing that, first of all, and second of all, I guess whether or not you trust that there was no movement between those MRIs. Good question. Thanks for that answer. This person wrote in that the, the name of that product is uh, Miata RTX, M-I-A-D-A RTX. Okay. 